Welcome to BGSU, David. Thank you, Penny. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful to have you. We really enjoyed your recital and the master class that you've oh, done. Thank you. As well as the teaching. Most of us had not heard the Ravel Sonata, the posthume mm. that you played for us. Mm -hmm. When did you discover that work? Well, I've known about that work, um, I guess, since my time in Bloomington, Indiana as a student. Uh, my teacher there, Franco Gulli, played it quite a bit. So I knew it existed, but um, I didn't really have a chance to learn it. So many people have told me that that was their favorite piece on the program. Oh, great. So I think being exposed to something new is always interesting. Terrific. Great. Can you tell me a little bit about your when you started to play the violin and your musical background? Sure. Well, I um, began at the age of three, uh, apparently in the back seat of my parents' car. I said I wanted to learn the violin, and uh, neither of my parents were musicians. So they did a little research and found a Suzuki program in Guelph, Ontario, which was my hometown, is my hometown. And I really lucked out. It's a wonderful Suzuki program. Mm. And um, I had a terrific teacher, Daphne Hughes, who started me. And my parents took me to hear the Toronto Symphony every year. We had a um, season subscription. And uh, by the time I was 10 or 11, I had finished the Suzuki books and mm -hmm. Daphne um, passed me on to one of Canada's um, best-known violin soloists, Moshe Hammer, who was a, or is a, a, a Hungarian-Israeli violinist who studied with the great Olona Feher, who was uh, Pinka Zuckerman's teacher, um, Shmuel Ashkenazi's teacher, I think it's Zach Perlman and perhaps Shulman's. <coughs> and he was also a one-time student of Yasha Heifetz. Mm. So for a 12-year-old to be studying with somebody like that was quite intimidating at first, I should say. And then I moved, moved on to David Zafer at the University of Toronto, who was a pupil of Oskar Shumsky. And through him, I really learned the physics, how to play the violin, how to hold the bow. That was my sort of formative training. And then um, for university, I studied with Francis Chaplin, who was James Ennis's um, teacher in Manitoba. And unfortunately, he passed away um, tragically during my first year with him. Um, but fortunately, Gwen Hobig, the concert uh, master of the Winnipeg Symphony, and a wonderful violinist and teacher, and a wonderful mentor, took me under her wings, took the whole class actually under her wings, and I studied with her for a few years, and then moved on to another Oscar Shomsky student, David Stewart, um, who then introduced me to Franco Gulli, with whom I studied in Europe in the summers for a few years, and then went to Bloomington. Worked with him, and then did my master's degree at the Peabody Conservatory with Martin Beaver from the Tokyo String Quartet. I should say, had it not been for Daphne Hughes when I was young, I probably wouldn't have continued the violin. Apparently, I was a rather challenging student. In what way? I probably didn't practice as much as I should have, and she came up with all sorts of ways to make the violin fun. Mm -hmm. She taught me how to love the violin. Franco Gulli, I learned so much of the, the old, grand old tradition of violin playing. And at the time, he was um, quite in demand as a violin scholar, really. Mm -hmm. At the time, his interpretations and his thoughts and his research on Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert, um, Brahms, were, were legendary. So I was really fortunate to work with him. And, and Martin Beaver was terrific, just a phenomenally gifted violinist and a wonderful person. And um, through him, he really sort of finished me off and kicked me out into the real world. So. I must say that in the United States, we do not get exposed to Canadian composers. Oh, well, many of them live here, I believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure they're Kelly Marie Murphy. And is she not living in New York City? I don't know. So what are some of the violin pieces that I should get to know by Canadian well, uh, composers? Well, Sophia Carmen Eckhart Gramate wrote um, a set of caprices for solo violin, which are very accessible, um, some more challenging than others, but certainly if uh, a student is able to successfully navigate the Rode caprices, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to navigate the Eckhart Gramate pieces. And they're, they're, they're great show pieces. Each mm -hmm. one invokes a certain image or a memory that she had from her past. Uh, one, I can't remember which number it was, maybe eight, 
depicts uh, snow falling outside, uh, I believe, a hospital while she was uh, watching her, her husband pass away. Mm -hmm. And so she, she, she would often write these caprices on, on the spur of the moment. She'd just be inspired and she'd write mm -hmm. something down. Is she still alive? No, she's not. Mm -hmm. So she, she's a wonderful composer. Uh, Andrew P. MacDonald has written a great violin concerto, which in Canada we have not the Grammys, but the Junos. It's the Canadian equivalent of the Grammy, mm -hmm. and his violin concerto won a Juno award. He's also written some sonatas and a great work for solo violin, rather challenging. Um, I think it's based on Scottish themes. So back to your childhood, do you have any siblings? I do not, I'm an only child. Okay. And you said you decided it in the back of the car, so was that because you'd just gone to an orchestra concert? Possibly, or my parents always had classical music on. So you knew what a violin was? I knew what a violin was. Um, I, I still remember the first recording. I, I would listen to this um, tape, back when tapes existed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Aaron Rosan playing the Tchaikovsky and Mendelssohn concertos. Oh. And uh, I wore the tape out. Mm. And a few years ago, I was browsing a used record store, and I came across a CD of the same recording. Oh. And I bought it just because it, it brought back so many memories as a right, child. Right, right. Yeah. And you've been teaching in universities for how many years now? Oh, since uh, 2002, mm -hmm. I think. What's one of your favorite things about teaching? Teaching students to teach themselves, watching their reactions when, when they get something is, is, is quite something. It's often frustrating for a while trying to get them to to achieve what it is what we're after, whether it's you know, smooth bow changes or as simple as learning how to hold the bow and print with a weight in the hand, uh, left hand work. The ones who um, experiment a lot and um, believe in serendipitous moments are the ones I, I find the most fascinating to teach. I like experimenting and I like exploring mm -hmm. and I like to open the students up and make them feel comfortable enough to experiment and to make mistakes and to explore what the possibilities are. Tell us about your violin. Oh, my violin was, uh, it's used. <laughs> Not too badly though. <laughs> Not too badly. It's a Carlo Tononi uh, from his period in Venice from around 1725. And um, I've had it, we've been together now for six years maybe. and. Um, a great relationship that we have. I love the violin. It took me a long time to, to find it. I don't know the provenance going all the way back to 1725, but I I can say that it's extremely reliable to travel with. Mm. It's not very temperamental, which, um, as you know, can be a, a real problem. And it's um, <clears throat> extremely responsive and usually easy to play. So um, that I enjoy. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure visiting with Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you.